Good morning, everyone. So I think we're running a few minutes over and it's good to get started. Uh, welcome back for day two of the ADRF. Uh, today's, uh, today is all about the community. So um, we are gonna talk a little bit about what the community has been up to. Um, the first session is gonna focus on uh, our strategic research, innovation and deployment agenda, our, our SRIDA. Um, and this is the official public launch of, of that document. So this document uh, is something that has been uh, a bit of a labor of love for the, for the SRIDA task force. Uh, there's been a lot of effort put into this over the past few months, and it, it is a document that details uh, where should we put, where we should be putting our efforts um, in terms of research and innovation uh, for the 2527 work program. How can that research and innovation help to um, identify some of the uh, solutions to the challenges that we are facing? Um, how can that um, how can we structure um, our efforts in Europe to make sure that AI is more is more trustworthy, um, that it's able to help um, drive some of the solutions for global challenges that I think uh, were, were detailed very, very well yesterday. Um, so in a moment, I'll be wel welcoming that panel uh, to the stage. Uh, before I get into things, I think uh, it, I'd like to uh, th say thank you very much to our sponsors again, without whom this uh, day wouldn't have been possible. So you can see see them all uh, on the screen now, and uh, we really, really appreciate um, your contributions to, to the event. Um, just as a reminder as well, please use the, the app. Um, the app will allow you to... Um, uh, drop any questions in for the panels that you might have. Uh, it details the program, so it's a very useful tool to working out what's happening for the rest of the day. So in terms of the agenda, uh, we're going to start with the, the plenary, so the official presentation of the of the SRIDA. Um, and then we are going to have our community-driven parallel sessions, uh, many of whom are, again, representing uh, the ADRA topic group. So it's an opportunity to learn about what's happening um, internally uh, at ADRA and, and get involved as well. So I think uh, it's fair to say that everybody uh, organizing those sessions today would be keen to hear from uh, members of the community who aren't yet involved, who may have an interest in getting involved and indeed who may have an interest in setting up their own topic group activities as well. So I encourage all of you to, to, to have a conversation and, and engage with, the, with those sessions. So, Without further ado, uh, I think it would be good to get started uh, on the first session. Uh, and I would like to introduce the speakers. So if you could all make your way to the front and I'll, and I'll name you all. Um, so firstly, uh, Freak Bomhoff from TNO, please take a seat. Frederick Hines, please take a seat. And, uh, Emanuela, do you want to sit in the front as well? Emanuela Rojari, Jardi, Address President. Lucilla Scioli, would you please take a seat? And, and Bjorn Uetzky as well, please. You may as well come right to the front so everybody gets to know, know you. Um, so thank you very much. Um, and Nabil, I'm very sorry. <laughs> and Nabil, bye bye. I'm sorry. Please take a seat and I will be calling each one of you to the speak. So the in terms of the, the agenda that we have um, for, for right now, uh, we're going to be speaking about uh, mapping EU's AI ecosystem, where Freak will be uh, detailing um, exactly his kind of analysis on that. Uh, then we'll have a presentation uh, from uh, Frederick on the SRIDA. Uh, Emanuela will um, give us a presentation on our Moonshot initiatives on some of the ideas that we've been uh, sharing internally. And then we're going to have a panel discussion 
um, with uh, all of our guests to, to, to get their reflections on the Srida and uh, how its utility and, and how we kind of um, progress that work going forward. So uh, I'd like to welcome uh, Freak to the lectern and uh, we can get started in the first session. Thanks very much. Well, good morning. Uh, we'll talk about SRIDA later on. SRIDA is a document that tells us the direction from current stage to some point in the future. But if you want to know where you are now, you need to know how to position yourself. And also, if you want to go from A to B, you need a map. And that's precisely what the Commission has asked us to do, to create a mapping of AI, data and robotics research in Europe. Um, so that's a task that was picked up by the Vision Project. It's a CSA project that is um, coordinating the networks of excellence for uh, trustworthy AI in Europe. And I will give you a very brief introduction into what we did there. There will be a more extensive workshop later this morning, also in this room on this. So if you want to know more details about the mapping, please stay here. But for now, I will give you a first peak preview. So. Yeah, so that was the assignment to map the uh, AI research in Europe uh, with a focus also on the excellence of the AI research. And um, we've been looking at both organizations and application areas because research alone is interesting, but once you apply it, it really becomes valuable. So that's also something that the commission wanted to know. But the vision project took up the task. Um, there was input from all the networks of excellence there. And well, the data was collected in the survey and I will present some of the first results there uh, today. So a map is supposed to bring you fr from A to B. And this has been the case for a thousand years already. So this is a map. I'm staying at the Mercure Hotel somewhere uh, near here, but not too close. So I need uh, definitely need a map to get to Inria. And well, this is the map that we all use um, it's, it's Google Maps and it brings you from A to B. Um, it does provide some information, but if you want to make an informed choice, you may need some additional information, like for instance, the traffic density, because a road bringing you from A to B can be interesting, but when it's completely filled with uh, other cars, you may want to, uh, to take a different route. So that's already an element that is very uh, important for drawing a good map. There may be alternative transport. Um, I didn't have a car available. I didn't want to take the, the taxi. So I just took a walk. Well, this is what Google Maps suggested to me. Well, those of you who took the same road yesterday will know that this road will not work for you. So maps can be unreliable because somewhere in the middle, just well around the run, but well, one of those blue dots is closed. It's a closed fence and you cannot pass. So. You may consider other forms of transport and then the map changes as well. If you would take the bike, this is what the suggestion of Google Maps is. And it will also indicate some of the bike paths that you can take. Um, but you may want a better map because Google Maps, it's not a European map. It's not maybe aligned with European values. So OpenStreetMap, there we are. So OpenStreetMap, it's much clearer, at least what I think. This is what OpenStreetMap suggests to me when I take the car. This is what they suggest when I go walking. Huh, okay, some improvements can still be needed, but it's an OpenStreetMap, so I can send a request to the friendly people behind OpenStreetMap and say, hey, please update the map for me. So there are many similarities between the maps in the real world and the maps for the AI research, because a map in the real world contains information on uh, cities and streets. So we translated that to um, categories of AI research and also the subtopics of AI research. And also the application areas, you could see application areas as something like the streets and also the type of streets. So if you want to go from A to B, what route do you take? Do you take the bike path or do you take a high road? So if you want to create an application, do you use machine learning or do you use knowledge graphs for that or a combination of both? And there's also much additional information that really should help you to identify the best route from A to B, like on real maps, the quality of the road or the traffic density or closed fences or whatever, which in our translation would be something like, what is the quality of the research? What is the quality of the results? Do we need some 
AI that you can buy everywhere? Or do we need the best AI that we can have that maybe is also aligned with European values or other uh, features? So this is all information that you need when you are mapping a complex landscape. Okay. And complex it was because some of you will recognize these two lists and some of you will also remember how much discussion has gone into the definition of these lists. Um, it hasn't been easy, but some people here in the room can tell you more about that process. But I think we can still be pretty um, uh, 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 positive about the end result. On the left, you see the 12 main categories of AI research with the number behind it indicating how many subtopics we have identified there. And on the right, you see the application areas also again, including the subtopics that we identified. And when you cross these, you reach a very large matrix that you can plot on a map to visualize it and to also to give you then information on, okay, so what does the landscape looks like? What can we, where should we, should we navigate if we want to reach a specific entry and situation? So you can also derive additional information from this. So this was based on a survey Almost 50% of the respondents work at universities, um, but there's also uh, research and technology organizations that are large and small companies. And this is already a little bit more interesting. So this is the, the various types of AI research that we've been uh, asking for. And this is how people are um, doing their self-assessment. And the blue parts on the top, the light blue parts, it's where people are saying we are world leading. So what you can say is that for see, for instance, is that machine learning is a topic that definitely many European organizations think that they are best at. But for instance, um, uh, computer audition, so that is uh, uh, speech to text, for instance, nobody indicated that they are world leading there. So that's definitely a weak point. So we can already identify this. And of course you can use a real map to plot it on. So where is the research actually taking place? Where should I go if I want to have top level AI research results? And we've built a prototype based on the survey. The survey was, I think, answered by today, some two thirds of all organizations in the networks of excellence. So that's already a huge representation of all AI research in Europe. So if you go to this website and if you browse around for the information, you already have a pretty good impression of what is the state of play of AI research in Europe? Of course, we've been working on various different types of visualizations, like how, how, mu how much uh, research is going on where, et cetera, et cetera. So, and we're still open for suggestions. In the workshop later today, you can bring in those suggestions, like I would also like to have this or that or that on the map so we can see how, uh, how we can include it in, uh, in the prototype that we have now. Um, but the only thing that we are missing is because we have now sketched the landscape, but we still want to know how to go from A to B. So you might say, well, this is A, but where is B? So that is what the Srida will inform us on. And what is then the navigation app that we have? Well, of course, it's the AI Networks of Excellence community that will provide the navigation app to navigate the landscape of AI research in Europe. So that's it. I hope that I can see you at the upcoming workshop about the mapping later today. And now I think it is time to go into the route through this map, which is also called the Srida. Frederick. Thank you, Frick. Uh, so uh, it's my great pleasure uh, to now present the work that we have been doing over the last little bit more than one year. So almost a year and a half that we have been working towards this strategic research, innovation and deployment agenda. Uh, so to, to kind of set the scene, if it works. Ah. Oh, now it's worked very well. <laughs> no, it's just slow. Okay, I'm too fast. Apologies for that. Uh, so now I think we will get uh, uh, to see their, their presentation in reverse. Um, I pressed several times, but now we'll see. Okay, maybe now. Now we'll press once and see what happens or when it happens. And then we can compute the delay and know how to calibrate our pressing the next time. So I guess this is a practical example of some reinforcement learning. Okay, uh, so you all know uh, the ADRA, uh, the AI Data and Robotics Partnership was formed two and a half years 
uh, uh, together between the commission and the private side represented by ADRA, uh, where the commission is investing 1.3 billion euros into this partnership. And we on the private side are expected to contribute at least as much, which means that this is a significant uh, effort that we are going, we are doing together. And uh, of course we have the five founding organizations, but ADRA today is an open member driven organization. And of course we want everyone to join and help in this important partnership. So the overarching mission, so to speak, that we have been uh, given uh, or that we have together defined is this to secure European sovereignty over AI data and robotics technologies and know-how. Uh, the second is to establish European leadership in AI data and robotics technologies with high socioeconomic and environmental impact. And of course, we don't we want to reduce the environmental impact. Uh, uh, reinforce a strong and global competitive position uh, of Europe in the areas of AI data and robotics. And I would say that even though we are a relatively young organization, I think we have already achieved the fact that we are today talking about AI data and robotics together, which we didn't do before this partnership was formed. And I think these are the things that can have large impact in the long term. So if we now go into the details uh, of this work on the street itself, uh, we started out last year uh, coming up with a strategic position paper uh, that was presented before the summer. So we have been organizing a number of workshops, a number of different events, uh, uh, collecting uh, input from the community because this is supposed to represent the best of our community. This is not an individual effort. It's, it's something that we want to do together. And by bringing the knowledge and expertise from all the different members, we can then come up with good recommendations. Uh, so this strategic orientation paper was presented before the summer. Uh, we had some, some workshops in uh, Brussels in uh, beginning of June, sorry, beginning of July, uh, when we presented this. Yeah, uh, and uh, there uh, we kind of refined this mission that we want. So we, we stated six things, namely we want to create a strong, coherent and effective ecosystem. So this is us working together. We also want to maintain and strengthen European industrial leadership in those areas where we have identified that we are already strong. Uh, we want to integrate and connect uh, the European research landscape around AI data and robotics. Uh, we want to develop a powerful strategy for skill development and attraction, which of course we all know is, is really key if you want to succeed. Uh, we also want to develop ADR technologies with this high socioeconomic impact to reinforce our strong and global competitive position. And we want to ensure social trust in AI, data and robotics. Uh, so we all know that there are challenges coming from the outside. Uh, we are in a more, what's a complex geopolitical situation that we were in a number of years before. Uh, we see that we need to take these uh, challenges relating to raw material, to demographics, to uh, global supply chains and all these things into serious considerations and make sure that we uh, are resilient and that we are able to deal with this uh, situation so that we can enable a, a sustainable and sustainable security and strategic autonomy for Europe. So uh, the, in this uh, position paper, we also uh, identify five strategic uh, high level directions uh, that we want to work towards trustworthy ADR technology made in Europe in, a, in compliance with the regulation. Uh, we should work towards European strategic autonomy in these areas and to use ADR technology to support strategic autonomy in other areas. So we see, of course, that ADR technology is not only important in itself, but it's also important in uh, enabling other technologies to uh, make progress. Uh, increase the resilience of our society to crisis, both natural and man-made. So again, it's about how do we make sure that we as a society are ready, that we're capable, and that we can deal with the things that happens. And of course, we want to push them in a positive direction. Uh, we also want to support the Green Deal, the Sustainable Society and Zero Carbon Emissions. So remember this uh, uh, global environment, the climate crisis, how do we make sure that we do our part towards uh, dealing with that? And the fifth one is on education, AI data and robotics. Uh, we also had four, sorry, five strategic technical directions. Uh, and here we have large scale general purpose ADR technology, 
Uh, so of course, here we also include uh, a generative AI and these kind of techniques. Large scale complex ADR test beds together with uh, end users. Multi-stakeholder development, verification, validation, and integration of automated decision-making, uh, collaborative autonomous systems, and metrics for measuring progress in ADR. So these were then kind of our position statements uh, that we made uh, before the summer. And then uh, since then, we have been working on uh, identifying uh, what we call uh, six big ticket items, uh, where we want to uh, focus the efforts the coming uh, two, three years. Uh, and they are the ones that I will uh, then be presenting. So this is just the, the process. Uh, so we we presented uh, this work also in at EBDBF uh, in Valencia two weeks ago. And then we have been improving the results since then. So if we look at the outline uh, of the, the Shrida, uh, there we will we start uh, with the, the vision for 2030. Uh, so these missions and goals that I uh, presented. Uh, we then have sections on the kind of major trends and gaps. Uh, including these global challenges. And then we have the, the kind of uh, main parts on the next strategic plan for 25 to 27, uh, where we are focusing on these big ticket items uh, in AI data and, and robotics, and also the European AI moonshot that uh, Emanuela will present uh, after this. And of course, education, reskilling and upskilling, which we identified that this is one of the key uh, challenges in order to, to succeed. So uh, the, the six uh, big ticket items that we identified or that we as a community, I would say, identified. So uh, after the uh, work on the strategic positioning paper, we had an embryo to this. And then together, including with the networks of excellence uh, at this workshop in Brussels in early July, we uh, improved and uh, solidified the kind of overall themes uh, we assigned working groups to each of these six areas. Uh, and these working groups have then been producing uh, text uh, that we have then uh, taken into the, the Shrida document. So the, the six uh, items start with groundbreaking technological foundations in AI data and robotics. And this is, of course, the, the foundations on which everything else builds. We need to be key drivers in innovation and research in these areas. Because if you're always building uh, the, your solutions on the technology that's publicly available or have been researched elsewhere, it means that you will always be behind. So in order to actually be on the very front, we need to develop these technologies ourselves. So therefore the first big ticket item is really on this groundbreaking technological foundations. Uh, and here, if we, uh, some of the specifics uh, is for example, we are interested in how can we increase the autonomy uh, in our system so that they are more capable? Uh, how do we make them uh, perform better, but also uh, very importantly, more predictable? So what we want is systems that we can actually trust and rely on. And in order to do that, we need to be able to predict what they will do and how they will handle different situations. Uh, so, so these are some of the, the key uh, aspects there. The second uh, big ticket item is on effective and trustworthy general purpose uh, ADR. And uh, here it's very much on, we both want to make these systems uh, more general. So we want to be able to use our systems to achieve more things without requiring significant manual uh, work to adapt and change these uh, systems. We also want them to be more effective, uh, completing uh, the intended work better, faster, with higher quality. And we also want them to uh, be effective in the sense of energy efficiency. So we know today that there is a, a lot of concerns about the energy usage of these large data centers and so on. So the more effective we can use, make the system from an energy point of view, the better it is. Um, so here, of course, we include everything regarding generative AI, but also uh, how do we make these systems more general? How do we make them continuously learning and improving over time? Uh, how can we scale these uh, complex systems that deal with this complexity in structured ways? The third big ticket item is on an interoperable and integrated framework for data and model ecosystems. So we all know the importance of data. We all know the importance of having 
uh, high quality models to support our applications and to build an integrated and interoperable fr uh, ecosystem framework for managing all of this, making this data available, making these models available so that it can actually come to the use uh, in uh, different applications. So here the important aspects are like operations. How do we govern these things? Privacy, security. Uh, the fourth big ticket item is a next generation smart embodied robotic system. So we all know that if we actually want to have systems operating in the physical world, having a physical body, uh, both sensing, but also interacting and um, uh, influencing the physical environment is, is, is necessary. So it's really important that we continue. And actually, I would say that robotics is, of course, an area where Europe is already very strong. Uh, so, so we want to continue this, but also take the next step. Uh, so uh, making these systems more uh, general, so more autonomous. Uh, manipulation is still a very hard uh, task to do. Uh, how do we make these systems more configurable so that we can, again, use them uh, in more applications without too much manual work? Uh, and last but definitely not least, we also have this very important area of human-robot interaction and human-robot collaboration. So the expectation is that uh, it will not be only AI or only robots, but rather it will be AI and robots and humans together solving these complex and challenging uh, tasks that we need to do. Uh, so it's paramount that these systems interact with us people in a uh, good manner. Uh, the fifth big ticket item is on developing ADR technologies for the sciences. And uh, there are many people that uh, argue that probably in the future, most of the Nobel Prizes uh, in all the different subjects, maybe now even including uh, uh, literature, uh, will be developed with ADR technology as an important component in accelerating and making uh, it possible to do science that we couldn't do before. So in some sense, it's about developing, uh, in, like the microscopes and telescopes and so on, the tools that allow us to improve and accelerate science itself. The last, but definitely not the least, is also research, innovation, and tools for compliance. So we want to uh, uh, comply with regulation, and therefore it's uh, essential that we have the, the, the tools and uh, innovation to meet the regulation so that we can build trustworthy, we can build private pri privacy-preserving systems that are uh, secure. Uh, and of course, the end goal is that we can make them uh, compliant by design. So following these methods, the end result will be that we have compliant system. So these are the, the big ticket items. There are more details in the document. I actually tried to make some slides trying to go into detail, but then yeah, just became too much. So it's much better to, to take a look at the document and, uh, and then we focus on the high level picture here. Uh, and then the, the last part is on education. Uh, so um, we all know that uh, having the skill, having the competence uh, is the enabler for everything else. If we don't have the competence, it will be very difficult to both do the research, innovation and deployment. So therefore, uh, it's, it's crucial for Europe that we actually have and can attract and to keep the talent that we need. Uh, and here, uh, I think it's important that we cover the full spectrum, uh, basically from increasing the general awareness around AI and ADR technology, and how do we uh, make sure that people engage with this ADR technology in a better way. So I think it's actually, I think it's very important that we as a society engage and that people in general in society engage with these questions, that we have these dialogues around what are the systems we want? How do we want to, to work with this technology? And of course, we want that to be based on facts rather than just feelings and opinions. So therefore, I think it's very important that we work with this ADR awareness and, and ADR engagement. Of course, if we then go into to schools and the kind of formal education system, I think that the, the, the starting point is this ADR literacy. So how do we make, what do everyone needs to know about these technologies? I mean, there have been a number of these literacies developed over time. So now um, oh, even turn down the, <laughs> okay, it was just a little bit, sorry. Uh, anyway, um, 
So what do we need to know? So basically, what, what are the things that everyone needs to know to be literate in today's society? And of course, there are already research going on, but I think there's much more needed to be done. Uh, uh, what we see today is, of course, that we do have bits and pieces of the, the education. So, I mean, uh, Europe is known for its very high quality education in general. We are a netto exporter of competence to the world. Uh, but when it comes to this ADR uh, area, I mean, it's, it's a new area. It's uh, fragmented into a number of different disciplines. So there is a need to uh, define and uh, uh, describe what does this area contain? What are the uh, subject matter content so that we can design education program uh, courses and so on around this. We also see that there is an increasing need for competence, which means that we need to scale up our educational capacity in these areas. Uh, so, I mean, we uh, those that work in universities know that there's usually quite a lot of pressure on these areas. So how do we scale that up? But actually what I think is more important and more challenging is how do we scale out the education in these areas uh, to other disciplines and other professions beyond the technical core? So today, ADR technology is mainly a technology related subject. It's mostly people from like engineering, computer science and similar uh, that are working on this. But what we see today is that uh, basically every profession, every discipline need to know and need to integrate these technologies and understanding of how they influence their profession or their subject. I mean, we can just take this aspect of uh, the, the, the legal part, the lawyers and so on, considering now this all the work around uh, regulation, but also the court cases that come up around this. You need people in the legal profession that understand the technology sufficiently well to interpret the laws in relation to that. So I think this is really a key challenge. How do we make sure that all these other areas also learn what they need to do. And of course, the, if we want to rapidly increase the number of people working in these fields, uh, the quickest way is to reskill and upskill people that are already working. And then they can even bring in their previous competence or the competence that they currently have and combine that uh, with the ADR uh, competence. And I think that is where we will see a lot of innovation, a lot of new ideas coming from that uh, integration combination of different disciplinary uh, knowledges. And of course, this is one way to really scale up uh, the capacity short, I mean, in, in the short term. Uh, so uh, this uh, concludes uh, the presentation of the Shrida. So basically the uh, strategic positions, uh, the big ticket items, and uh, where we are when it comes to uh, education, reskilling, and upskilling. And of course, this is uh, not, uh, this is something for the community. So please join us in improving uh, and extending this. But of course, also, how can we realize the things together that we have started to uh, uh, identify? So please join us. Thank you. Now I think it's Emanuela. <laughs> Let's see if I'm luckier with the presentation. Otherwise, I will just do it. Okay, thank you. I think that we we heard. Uh, I mean, what we're doing with the mapping, and then with Frick, Frick and then we we started uh, having a look at the Zrida, which I really invite you to read because it's a very complete and solid document. So they really did a very good job developing it. And now here we are for the moonshot. So I know that the expectations are very high. We, we really want to deliver, I mean, the reason why today we want to do a moonshot and we think that this is the right way for Europe to go in this moment. So yesterday we, okay, it's working, European AI moonshot. Okay, so yesterday we spent quite some time about the, the situation that we're living. So everybody said that we're living a sort of global tech revolution. We have several crises. We even have some wars near us today. And we are really sort of, I mean, Europe is getting very sensitive about all these things that are happening around us. But I think that we are also reacting and we're reacting, we are, we are reacting quite well. And here are all the, um, the initiatives that have been taken by the European Commission to 
react to what is happening around the world in this moment. So we have the European AI a Chips Act, the European Strategic Reliance, Resilience in Pharmaceutical, then we have the Critical Raw Material, Raw Material Act, the Data Act, and then of course the Cyber uh, European Cyber Resilience Act. So there are lots of initiatives that have been taken and we heard them yesterday from Lucilla, I mean, really to react or what is happening today around the world. But probably this is not enough. This is not enough because we, I mean, we really think that there are too many changes going on at the moment. I mean, not only in Europe, but really, I mean, if we look at what happened, I mean, in the past weeks around the world, we really see that it's very difficult to follow up uh, with everything that is happening with all the initiatives that are presented around AI, data and robotics and technology in general. So we saw last week, uh, United States presented the first executive order. Then we've seen the new plan uh, in China a couple of weeks ago. Then we see that Saudi Arabia, they're doing lots of things on AI. India, UK with the safety summit, Germany is just presenting a new AI plan. And then of course, Canada and lots of other things that are really happening. So today we are really having on one side, lots of challenges. There are some risks, even if we prefer to talk about the positive things, but there are some risks and there are some threats. So what can we do to not only to react, but to drive this moment and to drive this innovation? Of course, I mean, we could do, there are talking a lot about generative AI. Yesterday we talked also a lot about generative AI. We could try to lead on generative AI today, but the point is that we, whatever we do, are we still on time to do something? Because everything that we're doing, it looks like, I mean, we are always too late. And so we're not really driving the innovation. And then, I mean, everything that it's done, and I think that we did, I mean, yesterday we heard that we are really doing lots of things in Europe, but it's not enough because, I mean, if we look at what we're doing, we think that it's not enough. So we need to do something different. They're very fragmented, what we're doing. And there are some risks. I mean, yesterday somebody started talking about the job problem because we all agree on, I mean, most of the people agree at least that there will be, I mean, some job will be replaced. There will be some new jobs, but like, I mean, they just said, and they analyzed also in this read, I mean, we're not ready. I mean, for the new job, we are missing the reskilling and upskilling. And of course, I mean, then the, there is the biggest take, and we saw it in the in this read and the presentation of Frederick. Here, I mean, we are really talking about not only the technological autonomy of Europe, but we are really talking, like also Lucilla mentioned yesterday, it, uh, I mean, the, it, it, it strategic, I would say, uh, autonomy of Europe. And this is today is really depending also on the investment that we will be doing in AI, in data and robotics in the next years. So we are really facing a difficult situation at the moment, but I think that there is also a good opportunity because when you are in the middle of a difficult situation, you really can do something, I mean, to go ahead. So when we have the meetings with the, with the commission, we had several meetings this year, they always ask us, I mean, what can we do? I mean, you are the private partner of, of the partnership. So we need to do something. I mean, so talk with your founding organization, uh, involve the members and come with a proposal on something that we can really do together as Europe. So we did it and we started talking with them about this idea a couple of months ago. And we really think that we need something that is big, that is ambition, ambitious, that is uh, um, exploratory and it's groundbreaking. And we really think that this thing that we need today, that we need today is a moonshot for Europe. It has to be long-term and flexible in content. It has to be able to react quick because like yesterday, when we were listening to the panelists, what they told us is that we need something tomorrow. I mean, not in 18 months, not in five years. We need something that has an impact tomorrow for us or today for us. And then of course we need to deliver, I mean, we need to agree on the goal and need to be, I mean, to be able to deliver also something. And we call this a European AI moonshot. So when you think about a moonshot, the first moonshot one was the Apollo 11 and they took the, the first human to the moon. I don't know if we're really going to the moon today is the right destination because we've already been there. Uh, probably going to Mars would be a better definition. So maybe we could call it a Mars shot, but really we need to do something big 
together, I mean, all the community together. And this is what we really want to do uh, together with you. And this is what we started already. So of course, we, I mean, we started working on, uh, I mean, on some ideas. Uh, we already have a proposal on the table, but we really think that the, so here there are some ideas, but I really think that, I mean, more than going into the detail of it, I will just mention a couple of them. It makes sense really to think about, I mean, what can be done together. And uh, there is already the moonshot proposal is already included in this reader. Is a call for a moonshot because we really think that uh, it needs further development, and most of it it needs to be developed with all the partners, so the research, the industry, and of course, I mean the the, the European Commission and the civil society. And why it is important because. We need something also that will change the narrative, like we heard yesterday on AI today, something on which the smaller companies, the SMEs that are the majority of companies in Europe, they can trust and they can see, they can use AI in Europe in a safe and in a trustworthy way, which is the European vision. And then we need people to start using European AI, the best AI, Frank said the best AI developed on European value. So what we think is that we need to have the, in, the control over the entire value chain of AI. Of course, if we go out to the market and saying, okay, this is the, the European moonshot, we have to control the value chain of AI, is not something that people will say, oh, this is fantastic. I mean, it's not like going to the moon. So this is why we need to further work on the concept and to find something that it's also, I mean, appealing for the public, for the SMEs, for the industry and for everyone and everybody really would like to do it together, together with us. So we were thinking about a 10 year program, of course, I mean, with some short term and middle term deliveries. Uh, we need funding from European Commission, but we also need private funding because we really need the support of the private companies in this. And OK, we started thinking about something big, but we started thinking about the cheap acts so of 100 billion. Uh, we need to work a little bit more on the budget but i think that it has to be a big project with big funding so that we can really deliver something big and then uh, i mean of course we need to have i mean to involve uh, to have synergies with all the european commission strategies and initiatives and then we also need to have, of course, a smart control over the cost and over the investment and then to have some results that can be measured and this is also very very important so just a um, few information about the way we want to do it. We think that it has to be a multi-stakeholder organization. And of course, as ADRA, I mean, we will manage it because we want to put it, I mean, we put it, the idea came from the founding organization, some founding organization. We work together with some members of ADRA and we really think that this is something that should be managed by ADRA, the European AI Moonshot. And I will just go through the roadmap. Um, we started pre working on a draft. Uh, so we will be with some of you. We already shared it because we had some meetings. And I think that the next two or three months uh, will really be like, I mean, getting a more um, a solid uh, proposal on the table. There is already proposal, but I think we need to work on it and to further develop it. And then, of course, I mean, we think that by mid-March or March or April next year, we should have a final proposal. Also, because like we mentioned yesterday, next year there will be the election in Europe. And so we really think that it's a great opportunity for the entire, entire community of AI, data and robotics, but for the entire tech communities to present something that can be realized by the next commission in Europe. So I think it's this is a very important timeline as well. And um, the last thing, I think that this is again, it's a great opportunity and it's the right moment. Uh, and we are also the right people to do it in this moment. So I really think that if you want to be part of this project, and we all agree that we need something like this today in Europe. I mean, to, to really to make Europe again leading, like uh, Frederick said, I mean, the innovation globally and really to do something for Europe and for European citizens. So if you want to do it, please, like uh, Frederick said, join ADRA and we will be working in the next five, six months really to, de to deliver, I mean, a European AI moonshot. Thank you. Hello? Okay, great. Microphone is working. So, sure. yeah. okay. <laughs> great. 
So thank you very much, uh, Emanuela. I just thought, just before before we start, I think I wanted to get a quick uh, bit of audience engagement. Just just on reflection, is who who thinks that an initiative like this, if you could raise your hands, is kind of really what we require? Because we've done a little bit of engagement with the community and it feels like sentiment is very similar. But uh, if we could just get a show of hands, who who feels an initiative like this is is necessary for Europe to be able to compete globally? And I think uh, just... Uh, <laughs> If there's a you know I, I think a vast majority of hands and 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 it's certainly when speaking to people uh, in on an individual uh, basis it, it's certainly a sentiment that comes through, but anyway on 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 that note I wanted to bring in uh, our European Commission colleagues who've been sat very very patiently here uh, listening to all of the presentations, and um, the the question I wanted to start with is in relation to the to the, to the Sreda and uh, how. The Commission will now take this document and uh, use the content, uh, use the priorities that have been set out there to uh, influence kind of resource allocations and the shape of uh, the work programs. So what is the process now? How are you going to take um, this document and, 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 and use it? Uh, okay, thank you. Good morning, everyone, and uh, thanks very much for the question and thank you for the pre presentations that were very informative. Now, we have received this RIDA very recently, so we have not uh, yet uh, fully analyzed it. But the idea of a strategic research agenda is to influence, of course, the design of the calls that we make under Horizon Europe um, in this particular case. And, uh, um, but not only Horizon Europe, actually, we also have the Digital Europe program, which is a program uh, to support, to strengthen digital capacities in the European Union, where, for example, we also uh, spend budget on skills. We have um, an objective completely dedicated to skills and also an objective on uh, artificial intelligence and data. So I think that, uh, um, I would say that uh, this uh, strategic research agenda can uh, very well influence both uh, the Horizon Europe program and the Digital Europe program. Um, it's very important because uh, the way we design the calls, of course, has to be based uh, on expert advice from the scientific community. So this is what ADRA can, can really bring. Uh, the reflection of the scientific community and indicate to the Commission the main objectives and the main gaps uh, around which uh, we should be um, investing. Uh, of course, uh, we would have, I will not hide that we would have liked to see the strategic agenda earlier because we have written a, uh, already the, the program for 2024. We have discussed it with ADRA representatives in different occasions, but of course having a written contribution is very, very useful. Um, we discussed yesterday about the fact that, and Emanuela mentioned it now, why are we late for generative AI and all this? Uh, I'm just a bureaucrat, so I would have certainly benefited from having advice on developments that were already ongoing, I think, at the research level on generative AI much earlier. So we need this kind of inputs from the scientific community not to be too late compared to the rest of the world. The partnership is new. This is fine. Um, uh, we will uh, look with attention to this uh, strategic agenda, but I would like everybody to know that um, the, the strategic agenda is extremely important to us, uh, to signal to us where the main developments are taking place, uh, because this is our source of knowledge. And maybe a very last comment I would like to make. We heard about the main priorities presented by Frederick. Um, we also need to, to see how these priorities uh, articulate around industrial needs. So for us, uh, the research agenda is also very much about industrial research, in particular for the partnership. And maybe this is a difference with the uh, excellence research networks. Um, and so I realize you had too many slides, Frederick, but uh, uh, I'm sure that looking at the agenda itself, uh, we will also be able to gather more information about the industrial applications and the needs we have at the level of industry in this area. Should I comment as well? Yes, please do. 
Thanks, Philippe, and, and thanks for all the uh, editors and the contributors to this um, research agenda. I think it's, despite us having received it only two days ago, it looks rather comprehensive, but I mean, we have to have a more in-depth look at this, of course. Maybe I just comment on some of the big ticket items that are more related um, to, to data. So this big ticket three on interoperable data ecosystems. I mean, this I think is well in line with also our, our priorities we're discussing. I mean, data spaces, digital twins, um, uh, identity management. These are topics that come up every time we have a discussion internally as well. And of course, crucially also the interoperability between different um, data ecosystems. I mean, this point is especially important, I think, to really create this European single market of data to have all these data spaces being interoperable um, with each other. Um, and we are very closely looking at that um, also from a standardization point of view. I also find the big ticket item six interesting, the, the tools for compliance. But there I would say we have to be even bolder. I mean, why only focus on compliance with the AI Act or the data regulation? Why not have a broader approach? I mean, AI tools for compliance in general. I mean, the big talk um, in Brussels and all capitals at the moment is the fight against bureaucracy, for example, no more paper documentation and so on. And I think these tools can play a role there as well. So I think there we should be really bolder and look beyond just AI Act, Data Act, Data Governance Act, and basically all legislation and how we can use these tools and data spaces um, uh, for compliance. Then I would also just reiterate the call I made already yesterday in the session on generative AI, that um, the D in Strida not only stands for development, but also for data. Um, so maybe we can use this process as well for, for you to inform us and the commission about your data needs. And then it's up to us to find a mechanism how we make that data available. So I think that would be my plea as well that we can also think uh, about that. And then my final point is um, this big ticket on measuring technological progress. I think that's also absolutely important. I often feel that, I mean, we all think there are you know exponential developments, but are they? I mean, how fast is the technology really developing? Can we objectively somehow you know measure that? Um, and that would be really important for us policymakers as well um, to have a really objective, um, you know, um, foundation on on which to work on. So overall, I think um, looks pretty good. But I mean, there are some areas I think where we can still improve. Okay, very good. Actually, that's a nice nice segue to a, a follow up question that I have just on something that you mentioned because. Um, you know, we're well aware now that, you know, AI causes very, very rapid technological uh, change and uh, generative AI was a surprise to, to, to all of us, I think. Um, so is is there a kind of conscious recognition within the EC now that, that you might, these surprises might come up more often and that you have to be prepared to react to them in that case uh, much more immediately? Uh, indeed, yes, and uh, certainly um, we expect uh, the next uh, technological shift in AI to, to take place relatively quickly because we have already seen in the United States by some of the players that while the, the, the language models right now are based on uh, you know, these probabilistic approaches to the sequence of words, there is already uh, advances in terms of uh, greater... Um, Conscious, no, consciousness is not the right word, but greater causality, probably I should use this word in terms of the way that uh, um, uh, the, 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 the output is generated uh, by, by this model. So we do expect already, at least from what we have seen in the United States and what we heard from some of the um, developers, uh, some advances taking place relatively quickly in the next five years. So I would uh, really expect the community in Europe to, to help us also identify these trends as early as possible, because yesterday, we had sessions where it was remarked how long it takes to the European Commission to publish a call and then to, um, uh, you know, between the, the time we publish a call and the time that we, the, the work actually starts. But uh, we also have to become quicker in letting those who write the calls uh, about the needs that are out there so that we can really identify. Now, I can anticipate that there will be a call on generative AI, and that will be addressing more the next generation of these uh, um, frontier models, let's call them like that. So I hope that uh, many will participate, um, but of course it would have been better if you had this call before. Should I comment on this as yes, well? Please, please, uh, I think it was Niels Bohr who said that it's very difficult to make predictions, especially about the future. 
Um, and if you just look back five years or the beginning of the mandate of the von der Leyen Commission, I think no one predicted the corona pandemic, no one predicted the war in Ukraine, no one predicted LLMs, maybe some insiders, but not the, the broad public. So, I mean, the next five years, we'll probably see a lot of more surprises as well, both technologically, politically, um, societally. Um, and I think we just have to be more humble, also as public policy makers, and more agile as well in our processes. I mean, two-year work programs, is that still a good model to follow? Maybe that's also some of fundamental questions we have to ask. Um, you know, can you really, you know, fix now already how you fund projects in 2027, which will deliver in 2028? Um, maybe this is also something that uh, we have to look into, to be honest. So overall, I think we as you know, public policy makers, we have to be more humble and more agile and also adjust our instruments accordingly. Thanks very much, Frederick. Yes, I want to comment on a, on a few things. I think there's a lot of interesting parts here. So actually, I think when it comes to this, uh, I would say, the speed of delivery. So, I mean, uh, if you, when you mentioned industry, I think it's interesting. I mean, you talk to industry, they are always shortening their production cycles. Now they have to produce the next version, the next design faster and faster. And then if I look at my own university, if we look, if we want to introduce a new education program, actually it takes longer and longer uh, for us to introduce new education programs because there are more things we need to take into consideration. So it's interesting that at least I'm mean, talking from a university perspective, our timelines is getting longer while industry's timelines are getting shorter. And I think that's a generic problem. How do we deal with that? I mean, you mentioned also how can we use AI technology to support us? I think that's one thing. But when it comes to this generative AI, I, I think in some sense, I mean, the technology to a large degree was there before. I think the the, the really the, the kind of thing that happened quickest is that when you scale things, suddenly at some point you go over a threshold and suddenly you go from interesting to broadly useful. And I think that part is really difficult to predict. But of course, the, there was a lot of technology around there uh, around there before. And then the third comment I wanted to make was about the uh, industry and, and this deployment. And of course, I, I would say that this uh, Shrida very much focus on how do we support industry? How do we support the deployment? And I also think that, I mean, taking, for example, this interoperable uh, data and model ecosystem as one thing, but also this compliance. I mean, these are things that uh, have been driven and uh, strongly endorsed by the, by the industry partners. And I also think ADR technology in general has this really nice feature that the distance from research to innovation to deployment is actually very short. And in many of our research, probably working with concrete applications with concrete companies solving actual problems. Uh, so I think actually we are in a fortunate situation where the distance between research and deployment is actually relatively short compared to many other areas. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much, Frederick. So the, the, the next question I have for you is in, in relation to kind of striking the balance between uh, enhancing innovation, but making sure that we we ensure kind of a high level of, of trust uh, with with AI technologies. So I'm just wondering whether you can comment a little bit on on the uh, AI Act and then we'll, sp we'll spend a moment on, on, on the Data Act as well. But how, how, how can these regulations help to... Um, enhance innovation at the same time as ensuring that we, we keep, there is a high level of trust uh, in the technologies themselves? Well, uh, the regulations, and I'm talking in particular of the AI Act, and I'll let Bjorn talk about the Data Act, um, is has the objective of enhancing trust. And so what we had seen even before we started writing it was the fact that many companies were not using AI because they were afraid that they, they wouldn't trust their, the technology, their customers wouldn't trust the technology. So here the idea is exactly to have uh, a, a piece of regulation with a specific objective of enhancing trust and therefore enhancing use of the technology itself. And as you, as you certainly know, it's very much, the regulation is very much targeted on certain high risk uh, use cases of artificial intelligence. So it's not regulating the technology at large, it's really only targeting what we consider to be high risk use cases where the risk is taken in relation to the violation of fundamental rights and of safety. Um, and uh, it is uh, written in a way like it follows the same approach of our product legislation in Europe, our basically the CE marking approach we have in the European Union. So it's an approach everybody knows. 
uh, if uh, um, uh, a certain uh, AI application falls uh, in the list of high risk uh, use cases, it would have to check uh, its uh, conformity before it's put on the European market. So this, the mechanism is quite simple. It already exists in the European Union. Uh, what this uh, um, uh, act has, on top of really only focusing on a limited number of applications of AI, is that it introduces sandboxes for uh, testing uh, artificial intelligence. So uh, small, medium enterprises and startups will have the possibility to test their innovation in sandboxes in the presence of competent authorities before putting their technology on the market. And that will also facilitate uh, their compliance. Now, I think Bjorn already anticipated it before. Uh, I think it's very important that uh, we um, uh, are capable in the European Union to develop instruments that can facilitate the compliance mechanism to the, to the Act. I have already been speaking to some companies and there are SMEs that are already doing this. Um, I think it's very useful and I hope it's European enterprises that continue to do this. Um, and so we need uh, more and more this kind of instruments that, for example, facilitate uh, documenting the fact that uh, in a specific application, the, the data set uh, uh, is not biased, for example, you know, that the outcome is not going to be biased and so on. So. Um, I really um, hope that uh, also from the research side, these kind of instruments can be developed. You have seen in the UK, the emphasis put uh, by uh, the event in the UK was exactly on an institute that develops uh, capabilities in terms of testing the large generative models. I think we should be doing the same in the European Union. We have the research network, excellence networks, we will talk to them about it. But I think it's also an area where ADRA could be uh, effectively active. Great, thanks for it. Bjorn, if, if you don't mind, do, 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 I just want to get a quick reaction from, from Freak, if that's okay, on, on, on these uh, testing facilities and, and how the networks of excellence can, can play into that role. Yeah, because indeed it's very good to design technology that is trustworthy, to have regulations in place that the technology aligns with, but you need to actually, actually establish how trustworthy it is. And that's the other part of the equation. That's also the end users. It's both the organizations that are deploying the systems, systems but also the end users because blind trust is, um, well, I don't think that is very wise uh, that people will only look at some formal uh, uh, logo and then say, oh, then it must be trustworthy. There also needs to be some kind of literacy, uh, both the organizations who are deploying AI, but also definitely the end users. So trust it comes from all actors in the whole value chain. I think the testing and experimentation facilities are a very important element in that as well. But I also don't think it's the only element. Right. Thank you very much. Just coming on the back to the data act. I mean, it's very quickly explained. Um, the innovation dimension, of course, is that through the data act, we will make much more data available. The big difference now is that the owners of IoT devices can decide what happens with their data. So they can give it to the original manufacturer, but they can also pass it on to another third party, to a data intermediary, and so on. So overall, much more data will be available for innovation. This is absolutely clear. Um, and this aspect is also then related, of course, to trust. So the user and the owner is fully in control, unlike now where it's a bit murky, companies just use the data without really asking the user. So, I mean, when you're in control, I hope you also trust the process. So, I mean, the Data Act really takes both boxes, I think, innovation and um, trustworthiness. Great. Thanks very much. And, and and just kind of quick follow-up question on that. So in terms of bringing towards uh, Europe towards interoperable, integrated data ecosystem, where from your personal kind of perception are we on that journey uh, of, of, of integration? Yeah, I think we have now put all the pillars in place. We have the Data Act. We have the Data Governance Act. Um, I mean, the AI also plays a role there, of course. Um, we've also now put the funding in place for all the data spaces, but now it's really the, the down-to-earth work of making it happen. So now it's really the implementation phase, um, and that requires then work on standardization, for example, to make the interoperability happen. Um, so the easy part we've done, uh, let's put it this way, now is the hard part of implementing all this and, and making it happen. But the overall goal for us, of course, is the creation of this European single market of data, which requires that all of this stuff is really fully interoperable. So... I would say 30% we are there of the way, 40% good. <laughs>
<laughs> Thank you very much for that. So, so moving on from from regulation now and uh, focusing a little bit on the global challenges that were mentioned uh, previously, as so one of the kind of uh, priorities for this read is to re respond directly to um, challenges like uh, limitations of resources and climate change, uh, which all put a pressure on on kind of European sustainability and on, and on our welfare system, our kind of st standard of living. So, so Nabil, I was wondering whether I can bring you into the conversation now and, and whether you can comment a little bit on, on specific combinations of AI data and robotics that could help tackle some of these pressures. If you can talk about that, yeah. thank you. Yeah, exactly. So it was mentioned by uh, uh, Lucy before that we need industrial context, we need to look into societal challenges to map those big ticket into this. And I just, I think the best is to show it in examples, the energy crisis that we got last year. So we saw how dependent we are on the gas from Russia, how dependent we are now on the fossil energy and so on and so forth. And I'm really happy that you, uh, Europe is going to this, uh, accelerating the green transition, but you can imagine we, are, we have to build huge infrastructure. So we have to build wind turbine, we have to build wind farms, we have to build solar farms, we, have, we are talking about green hydrogen plants, hydropower and so on and so forth, but we need to build them, we need to operate them, we need to manage them, we need to maintain them. It's impossible to, to do it by humans. So, and that's where data AI and robotics can come in place. So you, we need to really have a data in order to have visibility on this on this plant. We need to have uh, AI because we need to have predictive operation to deal with anomalies, to deal with unexpected events, because this will be a core element for supplying energy to Europe. And you need robots that can do this dirty job, go instead of humans climbing, you know, wind turbine and doing those repair and management. And, uh, and this is where you, you can have data, AI and robotics really supporting building uh, green energy in Europe as a uh, profitable and resilient uh, energy supply for Europe. Great, thanks very much. But of, but of course, we're not going to be able to do all these things without the required skill sets and, and, and the required education. So um, all of this is driven by uh, an educated and skilled uh, workforce. And uh, again, this is one of the areas that are covered uh, within the Sridi itself. So just let's uh, may perhaps ask all of the, all of the panelists um, what are their kind of most urgent uh, competencies that we need to address with regards to education and, and, and skills here? We start with you, Nabil. Yeah, so um, so it, it's uh, so now now the as you said, generative AI is really changing the whole landscape of of uh, competency now. So we need to really to uh, get uh, digital uh, tools uh, part of the skills from education, but also in companies because company will be digitalized. So we need to really uh, implement a processes such that. Uh, Digital skills are part of the daily life in uh, education and professional uh, professional life, and that's really important to implement at all levels. So, thank you very much. I want to bring in another dimension. I think this is also an opportunity, really, um, not really to you know that we we need all these new skills and you know lots of PhDs in computer science and data analytics. But at the same time, I think these tools also enable people without these skills to you know, access some of the knowledge behind it. And we discussed it yesterday in the session as well. Uh, I mean, suddenly you can, if you're a farmer, also have really deep insights from you know, the data gathered on your farm without you needing necessarily um, having a degree in computer science. Um, and now with the generative AI, you can also become a coder of apps without really knowing you know, how, how coding works. So I think this is also an important dimension we have to think of, that this is really you know, um, opening up a lot of opportunities for people without the skills. It's in a way the other side of the coin of, of the skilling debate, to be honest. You know? So I think that's something uh, important to consider as well in this discussion. Thank you very much. Yeah, I agree with what has been said. I also think uh, the generative AI is bringing more easily the personalized learning we've been looking for. Um, and uh, building on what was just said about uh, the fact that uh, everybody will can have access to, to these kind of skills, I think there is one category, this is what I hear uh, directly from the ground, is the fact that you know, nowadays we have a lot of masters in AI, data science, so there are data scientists around. When they go into work into companies or organizations in general, their main difficulty is that their bosses, meaning people of my age, for example, don't have those skills. And so it's very difficult for them to, uh, first of all, continue to learn on the job. Uh, and this is a big barrier they're facing right now. And secondly, of course, to bring new ideas to an organization because the boss doesn't understand them. So the training of those bosses is going to be extremely important. 
Yes, start on the top. Yes, that's. I think that, yeah, it's a very good, um, good uh, thing. But I mean, uh, I would say that I mean one consequence of exactly what Bjorn is saying is that I mean these tools are now being used by a broader range of uh, the population, and and actually I think that just increases the need for for yeah everyone or at least most people to have a. Uh, bigger under, I mean, more uh, deep understand. Well, deep is also the word, but I mean that they have a more appropriate uh, understanding of this technology. And actually, I've been working with uh, digitalization and school for for quite some time. Uh, and uh, the concept that we have been working very much is computational thinking. And I actually think that applies very well here because it's not only about understanding the, the technology, but, but more importantly, how do I solve problems when I'm using computations, computers, and so on as part of the process of achieving my goal? Just like if I'm a farmer trying to improve the, the, the yield of my farm, uh, how can I use computational techniques, computational tools to better understand the soil quality or when to apply the fertilizer or whatever it is, or which market to, to uh, sell it to and all these things. But uh, broadening the set of tools, the set of perspectives that one use when uh, in your daily activities, try to, to, to do what you're doing. And I think this computational thinking uh, is the, the the way to approach that and to uh, gather that. And I do think it's also different from di di digital competence in general. Actually, I'm using my own computer science department as a good example, because I think we are working on computational thinking every day. We are really good at solving this, but we are not necessarily very digital competent. We have really excellent people that are basically using paper and pen, uh, because but they're still working on computational problem. Uh, and I think digital competence and computational thinking are different things and both are needed. And uh, that I think is the foundation that everything else is built on. Thank you, Frederick, for this excellent point. And I'd like to elaborate on that because indeed I would, I would want to bring this even further. I think that some general ADR literacy in society is extremely important. Um, yesterday evening, someone told me that using Siri to switch off your lights is from an energy point of view totally useless because Siri, Siri uses way more energy than the lights will have used when you would just have let them on. And this is the core type of appreciation of technology behind all of these easy tools that we definitely need to understand much better. Um, I'd like to compare this, some people have heard this comparison before, also to, to food. We now have abundant food, we have safe food, we have cheap food because we didn't want to have hunger in the world anymore. But nowadays, more people around the world die of obesity instead of starvation. We're overusing it. And that means we need to have a basic understanding of the safety of healthy food. And the same is for ADR technology. We need to have a basic understanding of what ADR can do, what it cannot do, when it is useful to use it, and when it's not useful to use it. So I think ADR literacy is also a very important point, also to address the energy uh, footprint of all our wonderful technology, but also to give some pushback to the big tech uh, platforms that are uh, increasingly influencing our lives. So ADR um, literacy is one of the key points that I would bring to the discussion as well. Great, thanks very much everyone. So I did just wanna take one question on the audience. I know we're five minutes uh, over, but we started a little bit late, uh, but are there any questions from the audience firsthand? I think, I think I'm gonna have to give it to Holger. Are we doing the right thing? Are we spending our time wisely? Um, so my question to you is essentially this. Um, when the moonshot, the moonshot was launched, it happened in an 18 minute speech at Rice University, at a university. And the key part of that speech only took two minutes or so. And from that speech, I quote, we meet in an hour of challenge and change in a decade of hope and fear in an age of both knowledge and ignorance. And then it goes on and it says something that is now as clear and uh, appropriate as it was back then. It goes on to say, this is a breathtaking pace and such a pace cannot help to, but create new ails as it dispels old. So it is not surprising that some would have us stay where we are a little longer to rest, to wait. 
And I'm afraid I'm seeing that here. You know, Kennedy did not talk about, let's put some constraints and regulation as to who can go to space and do what. Actually, the Americans did that too later. The international, international community do that. I'm not saying this is a mistake. But the mistake we're making right now is that we're talking about long documents and interesting processes and the challenges of bureaucracy. And by the way, Bjorn, thank you very much for acknowledging very clearly what a problem is that is not created by you guys, but that we all have together, which is that our well-conceived bureaucratic processes are not able to function well in this time of rapid change. They're just not designed for it. And it's not your fault, not at all. I don't envy you at all. I think it must be bloody difficult to get things done within that system. But we all need to really change something. And that is, let's not take four to five months to think about what kind of moonshot might be worth doing. We know exactly what kind of moonshot we need to do. So in order that we don't experience a second Russian gas situation, you all know that in the United States, we're that close to having a second Trump administration. Think for a moment about what that might need, mean for European industries if we get cut off or delayed from the very technology that our society, our industry is making itself dependent on every minute that we speak here a little bit more. And then let's think about what we really should be discussing. We need a moonshot. We need it now. We need to go. Our American friends are very good at one thing. Move fast and break things. I'm not in favor of breaking things, not at all. But we really need to move a little faster here. We cannot afford to rest and wait and discuss until we have a solution that every angle of which has been examined. I know we're good at this, and I know we like doing this, but we cannot afford it right now. So what are you all prepared to do to move this thing forward and to move it not in February, in March, in May, when the new commission is established, but now? What are you prepared to do to move things at a reasonable pace, the pace we need to protect the values that we all share and to protect our future prosperity by making sure that this dependence that has already gone far too deep is broken quickly. What are you prepared to do? And then to our friends at the European Commission, I would say one thing. I do not envy your position, but we have to be earnest. And that means honest. In 2021, in August, you were given a document supported by a large part of the European AI community. And aside from this document, page 19, you got it. There are two areas that need to be supported more and need to be supported now. And they're natural language processing and robotics. So please don't tell me that you weren't told precisely what to invest in one and a half years before it was necessary. You were, and you dropped the ball on it. And that I think is unfortunate. And that cannot happen again because that got us to where we are now. Okay. Okay. Thanks very much. I th do think the session was properly So I. Yes, you have the right to reply. Yes. Yes, so I think I have the right to reply because uh, I think that just telling us you have to invest in NLP and robotics is not sufficient. We certainly did. And you can go and see how much budget we have been investing in AI and in robotics uh, in this past uh, two years. What was expected from your side was a bit more granularity, a little more nuance, uh, uh, and uh, you can see now you have made a presentation where you're telling us, European Commission, you have to spend 5 billion euros per year on a moonshot you have not defined. I mean, I think there was no definition of the moonshot here. All I saw was numbers, years, billions. And the comparison with the CHIPS Act, for which I'm responsible, I can tell you what the difference is. The difference is not that the European Commission prefers to invest in chips instead of AI, as many people have been hinting here recently. With the CHIPS Act, we had, first of all, it was a very fast process, and we have very clear numbers in terms of costs to be incurred and very specific objectives to achieve. And these have been developed by the industry and the researchers in that field. 
So I would like to have the same with artificial intelligence. And I can tell you that for a few years, I've been trying to map who is the European artificial intelligence in Europe, what are the main companies, and I'm still not able to do that. And the main companies that are developing artificial intelligence are probably, at the moment, I'm not sure they are members of ADRA. So there are, before you point the finger to the European Commission, I think you should look around you and make sure that you help developing an ecosystem of artificial intelligence that we are missing in Europe at the moment, not because of the European Commission, I think. I think you know, there is a lot of information that is missing and a lot of work that has to be done before we spend a lot of taxpayers' money on these objectives. Can I just compliment yeah. what, what Lucy said? Absolutely. Because we've indeed investing for a long time in natural language processing, and we're discussing the language edict, for example, which builds on all this research we've been doing for, for decades. I think the problem was that the order of magnitude wasn't clear to, to, to everybody, to us, but also not to the community. And, and you saying that it was on page 19 of a document, I think it's also an indication that it wasn't entirely clear in the community either. You know, otherwise it would have been on the front page, I guess. So um, I think, you know, we're all a bit guilty on, on this discussion that, you know, it wasn't totally visible to us that this was coming, but let's improve for the future. Great. Thank you very much. To, oh, uh, Manuela. I just want to say that, uh, I mean, it's true that we, I mean, we included the budget in the moonshot uh, because we just wanted to say that, I mean, we need a big investment. I don't know if it will be 100 billion, if it be 50 or 150, but the fact that we didn't present it today, it's not that it's not there because we've been working quite hard on the proposal on the moonshot. We just think uh, that as ADRA, I mean, we have also the responsibility to do it together with the consensus of our community. So we have a proposal and uh, I mean, we will present it more in detail, but we also need to further work on the proposal. So it's not that it was a number like this put on the table, but there is already a concrete proposal on the table. I'm very sorry. I would love to take the uh, question, but I think we, we've run very much over and we need to close the session. Uh, but thank you very much to our uh, panelists and uh, to the audience for a very, very, very robust discussion. Thank you very much. So, just as a fi final message, uh, I would encourage everybody uh, to come along to the final session where we'll be able to hear the uh, summaries of all of the workshops uh, that are happening in parallel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.